What's up, everybody? I'm the Goji Ryu Philosopher, and like a lot of people, I've had a lot more free time this quarantine than I know what to do with. If you're anything like me, you probably loved to read as a child. Books like the Percy Jackson series, Ender's Game, Harry Potter, and The Raven Boys were some of my favorite ways to spend a spare few hours as a kid. But as I grew up and my academic workload got more and more intense, I stopped having the time to read for fun, or really having the focus to sit down with just the written word and my imagination. Fortunately, the pandemic going on around the world, despite having cut off a semester of college for me and putting me really on edge about caring for my parents, has also given me a lot of extra free time. At first, I went through and watched a lot of shows that I'd been meaning to get around to, like Breaking Bad or Tower of God. Then I rewatched some old classics like Avatar The Last Airbender. I even binged YouTube content for days on end. However, I did eventually run out of shows, movies, and TikTok compilations, which brought me back to reading books at a rate much faster than I have in almost five years. And one of the books that I picked up just happens to be an unsung masterpiece. It's pretty common knowledge that all fiction doesn't often do martial arts very well. Kung Fu movies are campy fun, but not even anywhere in the neighborhood of being realistic. Anime like Dragon Ball and Hunter x Hunter use martial arts as a base for some interesting fights, but I don't really think that I need to point out that techniques like bungee gum or Super Saiyan Ultra Instinct aren't particularly likely to pop up in your dojo. And of course, I need an excuse to mention Karate is a Thing of the Spirit by Harry Cruz, which has Goodreads reviews that seem to indicate that it's a well-loved book, but as a depiction of martial arts, leaves all types of common decency to be desired. <laughs> Accurate depictions of martial arts aren't always necessary in the genre since, after all, the point is to tell a compelling story rather than a technically correct one. However, when martial arts are done really well in stories, it stands out. Which brings me to Ransom by Jay McKierney. McKierney rose to fame in 1984 with his first published novel, Bright Lights, Big City, a second-person story about drug use and the main character's process of grieving his lost mother after being left by his ex-wife. The next year, he published Ransom, a thoughtful tale about a disaffected American expat living in Japan after a tragic descent into, and pseudo-recovery from, depression caused by the deaths of his best friend and lover. People hated it. A lot of the people who were captivated by the energy of McCuney's debut felt let down by the novel's much more low-key, slice-of-life elements, and those who could make it past that were often shocked and confused by the sudden ending. When I first read it, it was on the recommendation of my mother, who had been recommended it by my father, and I also had an immense sense of shock and horror when I read the final pages. But this book is an absolute masterpiece. Perhaps doomed to be underappreciated by the vast majority of readers due to its technical understanding of karate and its change of pace from the style that made its author famous, but a goddamn masterpiece nevertheless. And I want to make a video about why. So this is Ransom, the best karate fiction I've ever read. Let's get into it. Spoilers from here on out for the rest of the story. If you want to read it before coming back and watching, I highly recommend that. I'll put another warning before the narrative climax so that if you're not convinced yet, you can still check it out without having it spoiled. Um, it should take about five or six hours to read at most, so come back when you're ready. Christopher Ransom, the son of a sellout TV executive, is an American expat living in a very spare residence in Kyoto, making a living as an English teacher in the year 1977. Almost all of his spare time is devoted to studying Goju Ryu Karate under a gruff, no-nonsense sensei. Ransom, as he is known to everyone in his life, has been living and training here for two years and is rapidly progressing as if driven by a single-minded goal to cleanse his soul through striking the Makiwara. Outside of the dojo, he trades dry quips and small talk with his fellow expat Miles Ryder, a Texan philanderer who runs Buffalo Rome, a seedy bar, and Hormone Derange, an import outlet for authentic cowboy goods. Sometime patron and sometime antagonist Frank DeVito, a former Marine whose knack for violence got him 86th from the service, occasionally shows up to challenge Ransom to a fight every now and then. Ransom is hoping to get his black belt soon, even though his sensei doesn't award black belts, except in the exceptional case of Ito, a friend and training partner whose composure leads Ransom to refer to him as the monk. However, Ransom's composure and progress are interrupted when Miles' mistress Marilyn comes to him begging for help. She's engaged to an Oyabun, 
one of the godfathers of the Japanese Yakuza, and he's seeking revenge on Miles for sleeping with his fiance. Miles had found his tires slashed that same morning, and while he and Ransom had suspected DeVito, Marilyn assures him that it was her fiance's man. Just like that, Ransom's quiet, hardworking life is upended as he desperately thinks of a strategy to keep Marilyn safe, all without letting his friend know the hot water he's gotten himself into. Throughout the narrative of the story, the audience has shown flashbacks to the life that brought Ransom to Kyoto. His family life was initially materially wealthy, but emotionally bankrupt as his father, an auteur playwright, slowly began to sell out to write commercial television scripts. The growing gulf between them only widened when Ransom was 14, and his mother died, and try as he might, Victor Ransom's increasingly out-of-touch attempts to reconnect with his son only ended up driving him further away, eventually driving him all the way to Pakistan with his college friend Ian and new lover Annette. Back in the Kyoto part of the story, Ransom begins to grapple with his new responsibility, having told Marilyn to tell the Oyabun that it was him, not Miles, with whom she had liaised. His sensei's habit for sneaking up behind him in public to test his reflexes, once a quirky teaching method, now contributed to his growing anxiety. All the while, his father continues to reach out and beg him to return home, entreaties that Ransom has gotten used to ignoring for the last two years and has no intent to start listening to now. And furthermore, as if to add insult to injury, DeVito, desperate for a match with Ransom, has begun to tail him to practice. As Marilyn's situation grows worse and her Oyabun's mistreatment of her escalates to domestic violence, Ransom and Miles go for a ski trip to Matsumoto, getting Miles out of the ray as a way of getting Miles out of the way and allowing Ransom to pay respects at a small shrine for the dead. Marilyn's predicament and her inability to rely on the law for escape due to her being an illegal immigrant from Korea remind Ransom of his own past, maybe so much that trying to help her has become a stand-in for some sort of penance for past sins. You see, back in Pakistan, Ian had hatched a plan of crossing to Afghanistan to purchase some hash, arranging a down payment, before letting the people he was purchasing from smuggle the product back into Pakistan. However, two weeks after making his foray into Afghanistan, Ian hadn't returned, and Ransom was stuck, waiting with the rest of the money for the deal, tending to Annette, who had fallen back into her heroin habit. She was declining as her addiction grew stronger and stronger, and eventually Ransom heard that Ian had been kidnapped and was being held for a ransom. Back in the main story, Ransom was finally making some significant improvement with his karate, managing to land a kick on his sensei. Eventually, the sensei asked him to stay after practice to demonstrate a double kick technique and invite him to go drinking, a pastime that Ransom had often ignored with his English students, but felt compelled to agree to with his sensei. After drinks, the sensei takes Ransom to a bath that performed a few extra services, and although Ransom turned these services down, he still felt that there were eyes on him from somewhere. Earlier that same day, his motorbike had had sugar poured into its gas tank to ruin it, and ever since then, he'd been noticing tattooed men leering at him from around town. Marilyn and Ransom eventually hatch a plan to go to a festival, trying to get out of Kyoto without arousing suspicions, and she started to come on to him. He turns her down, but unfortunately, DeVito managed to find and challenge Ransom, even so far away from Kyoto. Seeing that DeVito was at that point angry and desperate enough to attempt to drag Marilyn, and perhaps even Miles, into their conflict, Ransom dives into the river, avoiding a fight. However, the next day, he hears that his friend Miles has been beaten up into a coma. All right, here's where we get to the real spoilers. If you've gotten this far, and you want to experience the true shock of this book for yourself, skip to the time code that I'm going to put on screen. Even though everyone assumes that DeVito is responsible, Ransom goes to Marilyn first. He arranges a passport to get her out of Japan, hoping that this will keep her safe and divert the Oyabun's attention from Miles. This passport is French, Annette's. And this is the point in the story where we learn that the Puffin, who had been selling Annette her dope, had helped Ransom come up with the money for Ian's safe return, but only by selling Annette herself. However, when Miles wakes up, he tells Ransom that it was DeVito who was responsible for his beating, after having told him that Ransom was sleeping with Marilyn, which prompts Ransom to try and find Marilyn again, in case she's in danger. And when she finds him, she reveals that there never was an Oyabun. It was all a setup by his father to try and bring him back to the States. Hearing this, Ransom reaches out to his father, who has been in Tokyo on business, and arranges a confrontation. Despite it being initially a tense encounter and having a lot of harsh words exchanged, Ransom and his father eventually work out some of their differences, and although Ransom won't be moving back to California anytime soon, they go for a walk together, for the first time as adults it seems, on the philosopher's path. But the next day, Ransom receives a message from DeVito 
with a change in his demeanor. DeVito has been trailing Marilyn and is threatening her life if Ransom doesn't fight him. However, because of Ransom's evasiveness, he's no longer satisfied with just a fist fight. Instead, imagining himself to be a modern day samurai, DeVito proposes a fight with antique swords that he's stolen from the monastery where he lives. Ransom contemplates running away, but then he sees Miles with his new baby and decides that he can't abandon his friend to the mercy of an unhinged ex-marine, so he agrees to the fight. A final flashback reveals that Ransom's deal with the Pathan went wrong, leaving him with no money and two dead or as good as dead friends and no safe harbor. In the morning, we're back to DeVito and Ransom's final showdown. Now, no summary that I could write could do this scene justice, so please read this book. But here are the final two paragraphs, verbatim. DeVito inhaled deeply and tried to suck all the pain into his lungs. He let out a yell and attacked. As Ransom's blade met his own, DeVito kicked him in the gut, and when he doubled over, DeVito drew his arms back and struck with what the 16th century master Miyamoto Musashi called the flowing water cut. The blade entered diagonally between neck and shoulder, severing Ransom's spine. Standing over the body, DeVito watched the blood spilling from the open neck onto the white sand of the floodplain. So that's what it's like, he thought, as the rain began to fall and the rainy season commenced. Japanese literature makes frequent use of the term mono no aware, a phrase invented in the 18th century to describe a certain feature of Heian period Japanese literature, specifically in reference to the Genji Monogatari, a story of love and court drama written by an author known as Murasaki Shikibu. The Genji has been called the first novel ever written, and it follows the story of the son of an emperor who's removed from succession, giving him the surname Minamoto, meaning origin, which was a common surname for disinherited imperial family members. Because of how Japanese characters can be read, this character can also be pronounced Gen, leading to the protagonist, whose personal name is Hikaru, to call his family the Genji clan, literally the lineage of the origin. Genji Hikaru, whose political difficulties are tied to the fact that he was born by a concubine, has a series of love affairs with women of the court, including one of his father's wives, who was chosen specifically for her resemblance to Genji's mother, the Lady Aoi, who is his first wife, a girl named Murasaki, who he kidnaps and raises into a lover, and many other women. However, each of these loves is transient and fleeting. Mono no Aware best refers to scenes such as the final meeting between Genji and a lover who has renounced her affection for him and is about to withdraw into the temple life. The term has gone on to represent a bittersweet love and appreciation for the things in life that are fleeting, probably best known as the reason why the blooming of cherry blossoms, which fall within a week of their petals opening, is such an important Japanese cultural phenomenon. The term mono no aware is often translated as the pathos of things or ephemeral beauty. However, I think that these two translations aren't sufficient, or else I wouldn't have written the last two paragraphs to describe the history and importance of the term. There isn't really a simple translation that I feel can capture the sensation of pondering cicada shells wasting away after their inhabitants have hatched, or the tender ringing of the horyuji bell in autumn, or even the gentle last words of a calm but wounded soldier to his friend. Hopefully, though, these examples give you a sense of the emotional character that we're dealing with. When Ransom came out, it was judged quite harshly. When McCurney's first novel, Bright Light's Big City, had come out, it was a smash hit with the movie rights immediately optioned off and fame and fortune seeming to be on this young author's rising star. And Ransom's poor reception brought that star right back down to earth. Readers who came in expecting the same style as his debut were shocked to find the novel, which McKierney had begun writing prior to Bright Lights, was completely different in tone and content than its predecessor, and its connection to the drug community was more tenuous, gritty, and unappetizing. As I was writing this script, I found a more modern review that compares Ransom, unfairly in my opinion, to The Karate Kid, a wonderful if campy movie that you have all seen at least twice, which was released the year before this novel hit the scene. This review, which is linked in my sources, claims that the latter is less technically correct about karate, whereas the former is less emotionally moving. I disagree on both counts. The Karate Kid was written by Robert Mark Kamen, largely based on his own experiences with Gojiryu karate and bullying. One of Robert's relatives, an incredibly wise and humorous karateka named Roy Kamen, still trains and teaches Gojiryu in Manhattan, and I've had the distinct honor of training with him and his teacher, Kaio Ong, who studied under Toguchi Sensei. These guys know their stuff, and any variations from strictly canonical karate are likely the results of Pat Johnson and Fumio Demura, who both choreographed and performed stunts for the film, and who are masters of Tang Sudo and Shito Ryu, respectively. And as to Ransom being an emotionally moving narrative, well, that's what this whole video is about, so I'm not going to go into extra detail here. 
Even the reviewers who weren't hamstrung in their opinions by bright lights often had difficulty with the dense, technical descriptions of karate technique and practice. I'll admit that hearing about the title character punching the makiwara 50 times on each hand doesn't make for quite as compelling a read as kokyus and partying, but I personally preferred the former. However, even the few reviewers who soldiered past the well-researched martial arts descriptions and the difficult sections where the novel dips into more Japanese culture were often completely repelled by the conclusion. Several more modern, less professional reviewers remarked that the final two pages of the novel ruined the entire experience from them. Now, these people are entitled to their opinion, but at the risk of sounding somewhat unkind, those opinions happen to be garbage lies. Ransom was almost certainly doomed to go underappreciated by the critical scene of 1985. Nevertheless, it's a masterpiece, and maybe 35 years later, it can finally get the credit that it's due. Those parts of Ransom that most offended professional and amateur critics alike, its down-to-earth, almost meaning-free details, its meticulous rendering of karate practice, and even the sudden and shocking coda on Ransom's life, are all stunning examples of that mono no aware, evocations of a bittersweet beauty to which the American palate was not, and maybe still is not, accustomed. The blurb on the back of my father's copy of Ransom describes its plot and payoff as a sequence of events and consequences Ransom can forestall but not change. One of the central tensions of the story comes from this conflict between the fatalistic, narrative-focused outlook brought to the melodrama by Ransom and transient passage of time and life that ultimately asserts itself over Ransom's attempts to make meaning. This symbolism seems to be most present in Ransom's father, Victor, the playwright and TV producer, whose whole life is concerned with the creation and telling of stories. When Marilyn confronts Ransom and admits that she was hired, she tells him that her story about the Oyabun was nothing more than a rewritten gangster flick, with names and details altered to fit a more Japanese setting. Most of Victor's plots to get his son to return take the form of movie and television tropes, stories whose deeper meaning is ultimately supposed to serve to reveal the meaning of life to Ransom. He may reject these in the end, but he's ultimately unable to escape the urge, possibly Western, possibly Hollywood, to characterize events in his life along a meaningful narrative, ultimately only able to choose which plot lines to reject rather than rejecting the message as a whole. Even DeVito draws on his own notion of meaningful fate. In the several chapters that are written from DeVito's perspective, we see that he views his conflict with Ransom as symbolic of his struggles with his drill sergeant, with the self-important tribunal that drove him out of the military, and even as a metaphorical overcoming of the self, a maturation into the modern-day samurai he believes himself destined to be. On the other hand, reality repeatedly asserts itself as being without meaning, without purpose, through the banal minutia of daily life and the subversion of any of the characters' attempts to find meaning. The story that Ransom latches onto, the noble quest to save Marilyn, was ultimately a fiction created to give him an impetus to return home. In their exchange after Ransom discovers the setup, his father says, It seemed to me that you saw this karate of yours as training for some grand confrontation of good and evil. To which Ransom replies, So you thought you'd give me a fake version, show that everything's relative. Ransom, who set up this conflict in his mind as a way of paying penance for his betrayal of Ian and Annette, is forced to reckon with the fact that he can't go back and undo the past, even symbolically through solving a new problem. Both the tragedies and the beauties of the past are gone, unchangeable. After this confrontation, Ransom goes on a walk with his father down the path of the philosophers, the Tetsugakusha no Michi. Switching tacks for a second, it's clear that Jay McKierney put an immense amount of research into karate and tried to create as realistic a sense of training as possible for an audience who likely had little to no experience with martial arts. Ransom's goju ryu is practiced in a parking lot by a gym, reminiscent of the way that some senseis in the earlier parts of the 20th century would use their home gardens or even public parks as open-air, all-weather dojos. There are several scenes of full-contact sparring, but his dojo also works on kata and partnered bunkai drills, and even has makiwara training as a central element of its practice. And, like all good dojos, the sensei practices with his students. DeVito, by contrast, studies an unnamed style of karate, taught by a teacher who was known for performing in martial arts movies and being an all-around violent SOB. Even when describing a brutal, Fight Club-style perversion of the martial arts, imagine a mixture of Kyokushin's sparring with Count Dante's everything else, McKierney manages to make the description sound viscerally real. Perhaps the karate in question with DeVito is disreputable, but the fraternal violence and fetishization of pain remind me a lot of the technically deficient machismo-fueled karate that I've both seen and heard a lot about. 
There are plenty of pieces of fiction that use karate and martial arts as plot points, but I've never seen one as dedicated to realism as Ransom. When my mother and father first read this book, over 25 years ago, karate wasn't a part of their lives, and I wasn't even born yet. By pure chance, when I began karate, I started with, and have continued with to this day, the same style as Ransom. Reading this book as a karateka, I can recognize my own training in it. But when my parents read it for the first time, they recognized something real in it as well, even though they didn't have that context. Martial arts don't have to be realistic to tell a good story. In fact, the reality of karate practice is much more dull, repetitive, and painful than even the most realistic karate movie or book would have you believe. But Ransom is proof that realistic martial arts can tell a good story, and that fiction about karate doesn't have to dumb itself down to find an audience. The Genji Monogatari ends the story of Genji Hikaru with the death of one of his most cherished lovers, Murasaki. After contemplating the fleeting nature of life, Genji dies, but the audience isn't given a glimpse into his last moments. Instead, there's a chapter title called Kumogakure, meaning vanished into the clouds, but no words to accompany it. This unceremonious end, especially after a chapter of long musings on how quick life passes, make it easy to view Genji's life as one would view a cherry blossom, something beautiful but ultimately short-lived. Ransom may not have been quite as involved with romance as Genji, but his death, abrupt and unceremonious, feels like a variation on the same thing. The last chapter is told not from Ransom's perspective, but DeVito's. The audience doesn't know, and can never know, what Ransom was thinking in the end, or what it felt like to him as he was cut down. At the beginning of the duel, Ransom throws his sword's scabbard into the river, perhaps knowing already that he won't survive this encounter. This detail, and in fact the whole scene, is clearly based on the famous duel between Miyamoto Musashi and Sasaki Kojiro, down to the setting being in the sand, next to water, the abandonment of the scabbard, and the ultimate death of the one who did so. But I think that the choice to not focus on Ransom's final thoughts, but on DeVito's quiet reflection on killing, gives Ransom's death a poignancy that it wouldn't have had otherwise. In a sense, this karateka, bleeding out on the river shore, has his own kumogakure. Thanks for watching this video about one of my favorite books of all time. If you liked it, first off, please read Ransom, but you can also leave a like on this video and a comment letting me know if there's any other good karate fiction that I seem to have missed. While you're down there, if you'd like to see more videos where I talk about karate and philosophy, hit the subscribe button, as well as the notification icon, which will let you know when I upload new content. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and go in peace.